Hey everyone, uh, Nick Rowe. Uh, a few of you already know me in the crowd, um, but for those who don't, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. Uh, yeah, it's the best picture I could find. Um, I've been living in Ottawa since 2010, um, originally from Montreal, and yes, I don't like the Senators, I'm sorry. Um, I originally went to school at Concordia University, Bachelor's of Comp Sci, so originally trained as a developer. Um, turned out, eh, didn't really like it right off the bat, so chose a different path. I uh, got my first job working for Checkpoint up here in Ottawa, over in Canada. Um, worked there for a couple years, uh, then I went over to uh, the Bell Canada Security Operations Center. I worked there for a few years, uh, sort of cut my teeth in security ops, uh, you know, standard operating procedures, whatnot, touched a whole lot of different tools. Um, it was really a crucible, worked with some very difficult clients there. Um, after that, uh, I moved over to the Bank of Canada, discovered what it's like to have an unlimited uh, bankroll. So that's really nice when it comes to security tools. Uh, but uh, what it did, it was make some, very, some things very clear. Uh, having an unlimited bankroll does not mean that you're implementing your solutions properly. So anyways, we'll talk about that as we go. Um, and currently, I work for Bright Sky. I've been there for about eight months. Uh, we're doing um, some very cool things with regards to our security stack. Uh, we built a security tool stack for, uh, in, the, in our cloud uh, from scratch. Uh, so if you're interested, come talk to us at the booth, and uh, we'll uh, we'll give you more details on that. But anyways, that's me. Enough about me. Um, been to DEFCON, been to Black Hat, been to B-Sides quite a few times. Uh, I'd like to think I'm relatively active in the community, like to give back as much as I can. Um, so yeah. So just running through the agenda relatively quickly. Um, what are we trying to solve? It's always good to understand and ask the question, make sure we're not solving a problem that doesn't exist. Um, you know, what does software-defined networking offer us, especially when it comes to public and private cloud? Um, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily know the advantages and the, the, the capabilities that are natively present in those environments and how to leverage them to uh, further enhance their security posture. Um, we're going to talk about zoning and what zoning means in an SDN world, as well as in a world where I can do micro-segmentation. What does it mean? How do I apply it? Uh, it's very hard to do away with these legacy constructs. A lot of people are very glued to them, um, so we can figure out ways of um, jerry-rigging them into the future, I guess. Um, We'll talk about the framework that, I, uh, that I've come up with, uh, how I suggest to implement it. Again, it's uh, just a framework, it's just guidance, so feel free to add, modify, rm star, whatever you want. Um, we'll talk about the, the, how to use that uh, framework in a security policy, as well as a few uh, tips and tricks with regards to what happens after it's in place and how you log for that, that kind of system. So again, microseg is a big topic. Um, how we use it, this is what we're gonna dig into, right? All right, so absolutely, ultimate power, right? I have the ultimate power. I can stop every packet going to any system. I have a firewall at every VM. It's a great idea. Are we sure? Well, you know, this capability exists in public as well as private clouds. So why aren't people using it? Well, a lot of it is they're unsure that it's there. They don't know how to set it up. So we'll walk through a little bit of that, but uh, I'm not gonna touch on that too deeply. I'm more gonna talk about how you create policy structures. Um, but again, great, I can block everything. I, can, I, can, I have full visibility, right? And that's the name of the game in our field, visibility, right? Well. For those who don't know, microseg is basically VM to VM communication, right? It's, it's how do I restrict every VM and make it like it's in its own little subnet? It's, it's micro segments, right? Instead of having large segments where I have slash 24s and I have you know, 200 hosts on those systems, I can go down to one host sitting in its own isolated bubble that by default cannot talk to anything but itself. Um, the technologies that use microseg um, have matured over time. They're still maturing. They're, they're getting there. Um, I would say that it depends on the platform and the product that you choose that's gonna 
really impact uh, how effective this is. Um, but th that's, that's a, a, an assessment that, that you have to make. I've worked with a few different ones, and I can tell you that uh, there are, they range. It's like anything, right? Um, I'm going to talk about how do we build policies. So it's very simple to think about isolating your VMs in a single bubble. But how do I build policies that, are, that I can operationalize, that make sense when I look at them, um, and that, that don't, that, that enable business, right? Not an easy thing to do. You, it requires a lot of planning and forethought. So we're gonna dig into that a little bit now. Um, all right, shiny new capabilities, right? Everybody loves new toys, new buttons, um, me included. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to work on a huge implementation and that's where I really cut my teeth and figured out, you know, I had to go at it a couple times to come up with a framework that functioned. Um, so what can we do with SDN, right? With the, with the, with the new capabilities that SDN offers us. Um, we can do workload based, not just layer three and level layer four uh, access control, but we can also do IPS, proxy, SSL decrypt based on the same micro segmentation policies, depending on the product that you choose. You, it, again, very powerful capabilities that you can do on a very focused, uh, uh, um, almost surgical uh, precision, right? Um, flexible routing options. I can tell you that I've worked in Azure before, and in Azure, I'm able to literally just point, two systems can be on the same subnet, but I can tell them via an abstracted routing table to fire everything at a single host as if it was its default gateway, even though it's not. The SDN controllers are very, very powerful. Um, a great idea in, 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 uh, in its uh, creation. Um, all VM traffic can be logged. So I have no, no, no more blind spots. But do you realize how much log traffic or how much data that will generate? Traditionally, people have had a hard time logging all their firewalls. So what happens when you put a firewall in front of every VM? It's, it's significant, right? Um, the next step is tagging. Tagging is one of the most crucial components of microsegmentation. It's, it all boils down to attribution. We can attribute whatever type of metadata that we want to a VM, because then we can use that in our policies. So coming up with a proper tagging structure is very important, and I will, I'll touch on that um, in, in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, tagging is a new concept that's very much uh, alive in the public and private clouds, uh, depending on the platform that you uh, subscribe to. Um, Cloud-based firewalls can consume these. And this is what's nice, is that not only are you uh, able to build policies based on those native platforms, like your AWS, your, AWS, your Azure, or your VMware, that you can tag systems and then apply policies with, but you can also buy third-party firewalls that are going to be able to consume those tags and then create reference tables with which they can apply uh, policies. So when I, when I first learned this, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Well, and not, not only, depending on the vendor, sometimes you can even take those tables and migrate them over to systems that aren't directly connected to your virtual private cloud or to your cloud infrastructure. Um, so it's, it's a very flexible and very powerful way of attributing um, or, or of identifying and, and applying attributes to your VMs. All right, so let's talk a little bit about zoning. Um, I talked about that, I alluded to this a little bit before. Zoning is something that, you know, I've worked in, in federal government adjacent organizations and, and federal government adjacent organizations love ITSG 22. They, they love it, they, they don't want to get rid of it, but how does zoning work in a cloud environment, right? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with ITSG 22. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit afterwards. We'll go into some, some very specific detail. Um, again, ITSG 22 is a zoning model, right? For those who don't know. Um, but is it required in the cloud? A lot of people will tell you no, it doesn't matter, right? If I can microseg everything by itself, it doesn't matter. 
Um, I would disagree. I think it does matter, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, what the biggest one is probably going to be political. Um, when you try and sell uh, your C-level exec or your director on saying, I don't need zones in my cloud environment or my cloud tenant, they're going to tell you, that doesn't make sense. We have to zone it or else anybody can, can hop onto anything, right? And when you try to explain micro-segmentation to them, they won't necessarily understand. So from this perspective, I think it makes sense to translate some of the zoning constructs and some of the objects into um, the, these cloud-based zoning uh, uh, models. Um, and I would also say that uh, as a secondary reason, um, security policy development and uh, the implementation of policies requires a structure and zoning does give us a structure to work off of. So what do we do with it? What kind of structure am I gonna use? We'll get to that, I'm getting there. Um, then we, we talk about uh, um, not just micro-segmenting specific applications because it's very easy to say, you know, I've got a three-tier web app, I wanna keep that isolated to itself, uh, how do I, that's easy to micro-segment. But what about when I start talking about bigger services, common services, you know, universal services that, that everybody in my infrastructure is gonna use? Things like Active Directory, or things like DNS, or NTP, uh, or even common security services that need to be delivered or consumed within my infrastructure. Things like SIM, or Syslog, I need to forward syslog from a lot of systems, so how am I gonna deliver that as a micro, uh, in a micro-segmented environment, right? These are questions that a lot of people don't necessarily uh, uh, throw at themselves when they're, when they're building this kind of environment and then they get stuck and they're like, wow, I didn't plan for this. So I'm gonna show you how to plan for this, how to, how to the, my framework does take this into account um, and will definitely help operationalize your policy deployment. So it'll help you build a structure um, understand it and you know get get the most junior analysts to read something and make sense of it All right, so let's hop into frameworks. All right Again, let's reiterate some of the questions that we wanted. How do I apply ITSG 22 zoning to cloud environments? What new capabilities and what are my new capabilities and do they change things for me, right? Does my paradigm shift? Maybe. Uh, how do services, how, are, how do I qualify and quantify services? And how do I classify them? You know, I talked about universal or common or essential services. Uh, and then I've got my specific applications. Well, how do I go about categorizing those? You know, what makes a, 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 an essential service or a universal service a universal service? Um, so we'll go into that. Um, and then, the final one is, how do I operationalize my micro-segmented policy in such a way that, you know, I build it, I gold stamp it, I give it to ops, and ops, uh, and ops, it, it doesn't evolve into a, a tire fire, right? Because um, that's my worst nightmare. Um, all right, so this one's a bit of an eye chart, but uh, bear with me. On the left-hand side, you will find uh, the standard ITSG 22 zones. Uh, on the right-hand side, you will find what I am suggesting as the um, cloud ITSG 22 zones. So this is my interpretation of this, okay? Um, it has, in my opinion, this has all of the same functionality and, uh, uh, and, a, and, a, and keeps it with the, the spirit of ITSG 22 but it simplifies things. I've cut it down by three, three zone types. It makes, simplifies things significantly, right? But not really. <laughs> we'll get into that. There's, a, there's, an, there's an adverse consequence in my approach to reducing the zones from, from, from seven to four. Um, and I allude to it a little bit at the bottom here. You know, how do I talk about, we'll ask a question to the, to, to the, to the class here. Um, a restricted extranet zone or a third party zone. How do I deal with those when I don't have them here on the, on the, on the right hand side? Nobody? No? Yeah? So 
Absolutely. So what? Yeah. Yeah. So this is that's exactly what we're getting into. We've we're we're effectively getting to the point where we need to define a new zone construct. Okay. So we call it the zone instance group. Yes, it's not very creative, um, but effectively what it is is an instantiation of the three internal zones that you would see deployed in your environment, um, but cookie cutter. So the idea is that I can instantiate a set of zones on a per application, on a per service, on a per, and, and you gotta think service here, right? Because I don't wanna segment everything in such a way that every server is isolated from every other server, but I wanna do it in such a way that I'm enabling, that I'm, that I'm grouping uh, um, VMs and servers in such a way that they're delivering a service. You're not, you abstract away from this host is one of my DNS servers and this host is my compute server, whatever it may be. Get, get into identifying services and then putting those into a ZIG, if you can, a zone instance group. Um, that's the whole idea. And if you look at the mappings, public access zone, operation zone, and secure restricted zone, Ideally, you would map uh, uh, the, the, the respective security controls to those respective zone structures. So what does that look like in practice, right? All right, so in practice, this is what we're effectively building, right? Um, on the left-hand side, what I've got here is uh, the three stages of a software development lifecycle for our fictional application app 01, right? Production, staging, and development. Well, what do I do, like, when I deploy systems, I, I, I might have a full stack in development, my, my web server, my app server, and my database. I have the same stack in staging, and maybe I have a few more that, that make my stack a little bit more robust in production. What I'm doing is I'm effectively isolating them in their own bubbles. And then within those bubbles, I've got different zones that I'm restricting access to. So if you look on the left-hand side, I would put my web server in my public access zone, and then I would have my app server in the OZ, and then I would have my database in the SRZ. Now, my web server would never natively be able to talk to my, web, uh, my database server because they're in zones that according to ITSG 22, should never be able to talk to each other. But this also solves the same problem that I, that I brought up earlier, where if I have a, how do I deal with not having a third party zone or a restricted extranet zone? That's easy. I just take one of these zone instance groups and tag it as my restricted extranet zone or my third party zone or my th third party zone instance group. And now I have a grouping of zones that are used to deliver restricted extranet services. Same thing for uh, third-party services. And I can even go further and say, you know, a third-party service with vendor X has its own zone instance group, right? With, you know, whichever vendors or business partners you deal with. So now the resources that those people or those uh, third parties have access to is restricted to what's in that construct. Any questions? No? All right. Now we're getting into the fun stuff. Um, so how do we do this, right? We've, we've come up with a lot of the theoretical, the uh, um, you know, high level plans. Uh, I talk about constructs, I talk about tags, I talk about uh, um, you know, zones. How do I put it all together, right? This, this is the, the, the core of it. Um, what we're effectively doing is we're coming up with a structure of tags, a step one. Our structure of tags is going to attribute our VMs. And in, in this scenario, I'm attributing them based on, uh, on localization, right? I'm trying to locate them physically and logically within my environments. So as you can see, in, my, in this scenario, I chose to go with four tags, right? On a per VM basis. Tag one is my data center. Tag two is my environment. Tags three is my application or my service that I'm delivering within that environment, within, within that zone instance group. Tag four is my security zone. Now again, these tags are applied directly to the VM, right? So this is going to attribute my VM's location directly to that VM. 
So as you can see, I've got a few options that I outlined above in my, um, in my example. Uh, data center one, two, and three. Let's say I'm a three data center environment. I've got different environments, production, staging, QA, dev. I've got different apps, Apple one, Apple two, Apple three, core services, LDAP. You know, core services I could have defined as DNS, NTP, uh, you know, whatever else I want to define it within that. It's, it's very much a framework and not a rigid set of rules, right? So, and then tag four is just my zones. And the zones are the ones that don't change. The zones are, are, are if you follow my framework, uh, the zones won't really change. I mean, you, nothing stops you from adding another zone if you want, but it does complexify things a little bit. So as you can see, you know, in my tagging structure, I've effectively only really got maybe a dozen different tags in this environment, but that could grow significantly if the number of applications and services uh, uh, grow as well, right? Questions? Concerns? Is everybody still hungover? Okay. All right. Yeah. Is that gonna help you move, uh, move the machine from like uh, from the various like uh, stages, or because I'm just wondering how you move it from? Like, yes, ab absolutely could do that. So as as if you decide to do it that way, instead of doing code um, uh, pushes, um, you could do it that way where you you take a machine from dev to QA to prod or to to staging to prod, literally just by changing a tag, right? That's all you would have to do. And then from a network access perspective, assuming you have all your rules already predefined, you'd be set. That depends, right? Your environments might have different rule requirements, right? You might want dev to be a little bit less restrictive and give it more access to the internet for your developers to work freely. But then again, from a security perspective, you wouldn't necessarily want that VM that has full access to be moved to prod, right? So I wouldn't say that's a best practice. I'd say you're better off to do code pushes uh, and have your VMs stay static within those systems, within those uh, um, those uh, zone instance groups. Sorry? Absolutely. However you choose to do it, you could move the machines around literally just by changing a tag. Yep, it has access, assuming all your network flows are already predefined based on those tags. And we're gonna talk about how I apply those, uh, how, how I'm using those tags now, right? So in the previous slide, I, I said, okay, my VMs have four tags each, right? This is how we're going to use those tags. What effectively we're doing is we're, we're defining dynamic security groups. Dynamic security groups are just groups that are going to enforce a specific policy based on who's members of those. But the, the membership is dynamic because it's based on who has certain tags, right? So if I look at the, uh, if you look at the, the first set here, data center instance, the, the VMs that will be members of that group are going to be any VM that has tag one, data center zero one. So very simple, right? But I'm gonna have a lot of VMs in that group because assuming my environment, you know, Say I've got a couple hundred VMs in my data center, or maybe a couple thousand. That that can be that could be a big uh, um, a big group, but it doesn't matter. You'll see later on those are very practical in the way that we deliver common and essential services. So again, we 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 dig down a little bit, and we next we apply the environment to the group. So now this is a group that's going to include VMs that are part of data center, whichever data center you want data center one in this example, and the production environment. And then if we go down further, data center one, production, Apple one. So now I'm within my app zone instance group. So using this group, I refer to any VM that's within my zone instance group, right? And then furthermore, uh, lastly, you can see we're just applying a zone to it. So now I'm referring to within that zone, the zone Apple one zone instance group, and it's specifically, it's security restricted zone. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the way that I see your structure in your zones, it seems to be more tree-like. Why aren't you uh, defining those tags independent from one or the other so that if you apply a production tag, yep. 
whatever data center it, it is in, whatever app is being used, whatever it is, or whatever secure zone it is in, those are the rules that are applied to the production system here. You could do that. Um, if you, if you were, chose to not have a data center tied there, you could remove the data center tag from that framework, and then you could have just prod, right? But that would be irrelevant of which data center it is, yep. which... Yep, yeah. Right. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, again, some people like to uh, structure it in such a way where they have the, their apps that are running in a specific data center versus another data center. You could completely chop off the data center uh, tag from this framework and then just have prod Apple One. And then I have rules that apply to my Apple One, whether it lives in data center one, data center two, or data center three, right? So it's, it's again, it's a framework. It's, it's showing you how to build uh, groups as well as uh, tagging uh, attributes that deliver what you want, right? So in this example, this is what a policy structure would look like using those groups. So you can see um, at the top, I've got a defined set of global service rules. Um, these are going to be what we talked about. You know, if you look at uh, uh, the source, again, pretty straightforward. Data center one underscore production in the first rule. Destination is data center one underscore production underscore LDAP operation zone. So let's say I assume to throw my, uh, my Active Directory servers inside of my operation zone of my LDAP zone instance group. Well, now I've got my entirety of data center one production has access to Active Directory. As easy as that. And I can apply an IPS profile to it if I wanted to. Again, this depends on your third party integrations and the products that you choose to use, but it's just showcasing some of the, some of the capabilities, right? Um, if we dig down a little bit, you can see we've got an example of, you know, data center one's universal access to DNS. Data Center One's universal access to NTP. And again, in a dynamic nature. So that if a VM gets spun up in my environment and it's not tagged, it has access to nothing, right? Only once it's properly tagged will it have access to the right resources and the right services. Um, you know, a really good example I like to out outlay is, is the um, Data Center One production vScan. So from my perspective, I work in security primarily. So vulnerability scanning is a big part of what I do. So how do I set it up so that my vulnerability scanners have full access to my environment? Well, that's often been a problem. You know, I've got 30 or 40 or 100 firewalls deployed in my environment. How do I, I have to go in and manually add a rule to allow my scanners to go talk to all of these different networks? This is easy if I've got it centralized. Data center one, production, vScan, Oz. Assuming the vScan is my uh, vulnerability scanning zone instance group, and Oz is where I put my scanners, well, I've got complete access to the data center now. Easy as that. So you can see the benefits are starting to compound, right? There's a lot of benefits of tagging when you abstract away from using IP addresses um, in your rules. Below that, you can see we're talking about app 01 and app 02. And this is an example. These are example rule sets or policies that would show a, again, very standard three-tier web app with the internet having access to the public access zone, the public access zone having access to the operations zone to access whatever application server is in there, and then the application server having access to both the web as well as, or to the PaaS, as well as the secure restricted zone to access the database and respond to any application calls that, Marine, that, that it made. So you can see four rules and I have a pretty standard web app that functions, right? And I've got ITSG 22 zoning done. So I'm not foregoing any zoning and if I show this to any director or C-level, they'll see all my, zone all my zones in my names. So you can see I'm not, I'm not foregoing a lot of the work that was done historically and I'm keeping some artifacts of that um, to sort of make my, to, to help navigating the politics a little bit simpler when it comes to introducing a, a, a I like to think a groundbreaking new technology like this. Um, yeah.
Yep, a hundred percent. You could that, that you could effectively set up a uh, isolation tag that you throw onto a, a VM once you determine it's isolated, and then uh, it has access to nothing. Your first rule, at the top of your rule base, would be if you have this tag, drop. It's then black hole, right? Easy way to isolate a NACA box without having a NAC, right? So it's a really good use case I like to use. Um, Tanium is a really good one because Tanium is a very hard product. It's a very unique product in its functionality. Um, Tanium does a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communications between its agents when they're on the same subnets. And that was a, a, a problem that I had solved, but I wanted to present to you guys because I thought it was a very unique problem. Um, I don't see this a lot with other products, but um, you know, the problem, think about it, you say all my, all my agents on all my systems need to communicate in peer-to-peer. -peer. Well, how does that work when the native uh, uh, policy on all my VM-to-VM -VM communication is do not allow, right? Well, what I do, the solution to that is basically another global service rule. Um, if you look, I'm basically saying that for peer-to-peer -peer communication, I'm gonna allow prod to talk to prod on the service that Tanium uses. I'm gonna allow staging to talk to staging on the service that, sta that Tanium uses. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating uh, um, logical segments for communication between the agents within their respective environments that will not inhibit the functionality of the product, but that will uh, you know, keep it functioning, and I'm delivering it as a, as a common or as as a as a global service across my environment, right? And then finally, I'm saying my entire data center has access to my central Tanium server. So again, if you're not familiar with Tanium, that's a, this is a, a bit of a, a moot point, might be above your head, but in general, this <clears throat> this is a hard use case to crack when I when I was first presented with it, because how do you deal with peer-to-peer -peer communication? Right in a micro-segmented environment, it doesn't necessarily work. Um, all right, so let's talk about centralized policy management because this is a very, very important key to success for a micro-segmented deployment. Um, if you have the option, go with a, a, a vendor that allows you to do centralized policy management. If you don't have the option, um, go with a third-party solution that integrates with multiple systems. Uh, because I will tell you that if, if you're not consistent in your policy deployment, uh, you will have a lot of problems. Um, personally, I used uh, Checkpoint when I did the deployment, um, and it natively has centralized management and allows multiple policies to be created on a manager and pushed independently to multiple systems. So I found that one to be a compelling product. Um, but in this case, I mean, uh, Fortinet does this. Uh, centralized management's a little harder with Fortinets, in my opinion. But uh, you know, f from a centralized policy perspective, most people don't have greenfields and will need to go with a third with a third-party firewall policy software. So something like a FireMon or an AlgoSec will definitely fit the bill there. Now, does anybody remember what we talked about earlier? Um, as being the uh, uh, one of the big problems of microseg, yeah. we talked about logging, right? How much log traffic is generated by traditional firewalls? A ton. Everybody wants it in their sim or in their central log repo. Well, what happens when I put a firewall in front of every VM? Yeah. <laughs> You asked for it. Um, so most organizations will have predefined security policies or policies that say that you have to log all firewall traffic. Well, that's gonna be a big problem. Um, in this case, I would suggest looking at whether or not you can whitelist or, or not log some common or global services, things like DNS, things like NTP, if you can avoid it. Um, see if you can pull those log or that data source from somewhere else other than a, um, uh, a firewall that would be logging this information. Um, I would say that most sims do scale out and they can definitely accommodate the volume, 
but uh, your licensing might be um, a big a threshold to entry for that since most sims do volume-based licensing, which is going to be a big issue. So uh, one of the ways that we've gotten around it uh, personally, um, we like to use, uh, um, I, I would suggest using either a centralized log repo that doesn't do volume-based licensing, um, or we use a product, our sim uh, internally at BrightSky is uh, Curator, and Curator allows you to bypass the license to just log stuff to a log repo as a two-in-one. So I can send stuff to my sim, or I can send stuff to my centralized log repo, which is all part of the same infrastructure. So very flexible, but I mean, there's lots of ways to, to, dip, to <coughs> get around this problem. 